anyway, it's not an unlazy introduction really given, uh, given to a, uh, a presenter. Can I just say thank you very much for inviting me. It's really my pleasure. So, uh, and a Happy New Year, obviously belated, but, but Happy New Year to everybody. And thank you again for, for inviting me here. Um, so, 30 years is indeed a long time. And I'm just reflecting as I look at your faces, thinking I was there once, in actual fact, and I really didn't know anything. I had no idea where I wanted to go or, or career I wanted to start. All I knew was that I wanted to wear a suit and I wanted to wear one in the city of London, which is where all the financial institutions are. So I used to drive 17 year old driving up and down London London, going past the city of London, and I used to see all of these really immaculately dressed guys coming out, and girls, of course, coming out, and thinking, I wonder what life's like, I wonder what it's going to be like. Boy, they look really good. And so, over the years, you create a vision, and things happen, and so I had a fantastic opportunity to work in the city of London for a number of years, I think about 15 years, and it was absolutely amazing. So, I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of what finance is. Uh, for me, it still is a passion. So, every day I'm getting up, and I'm thinking, there's going to be something new. And I don't think I'll be let down in a career in finance at all. So, this is really culminating, if you like, of what finance is, and where it's going. So basically I'm looking at an area <coughs> apologies I'm pressing ahead. I'm looking at, a, at an area now of finance which is sometimes called smart beta or this type of investing. And as you all know what's happened is that we're talking about climate change everybody's worried about climate change, it's, it's really the main thing. So what can we do to reduce the amount of carbon footprint, carbon emissions, and obviously everything else that goes with it. So that is just one aspect of it, climate change. It, it's one of the most important ones. So if you look at my diagram, we have one area of this where we've got lush greenery in terms of trees and so on. And on the other side, we've got basically a desert, barren, and, and dead. If we're not really careful in the next decade, we'll probably end up going in this direction. So I think the world's just about waking up. So how are we going to stop this? Now, the responsibility lands on corporates who are building marvelous products and services for you. So they have the ultimate responsibility. But in actual fact, we have a lot of responsibility in fund management as well, because we direct the money into those companies. So we can decide as investors exactly who we want to invest in. Okay? So you are millennials, and in actual fact, I will be referring to you in this slide projection as well. So you are one of them. As a matter of fact, also, Women are becoming amazingly influential in this world. So millennials and women investors are incredibly interested in this area, which is sustainable finance. So if you've got any surplus cash and you're thinking about buying stocks or investing in companies, you are now looking at those companies in a completely different way, with a really critical eye. Okay, so, so you are going to be making your changes. So this particular um, presentation, if you like, is a whirlwind tour. I will not be able to teach you everything about finance. You may come back out of this and think I've got a clue what he's actually talked about. But so long as it leaves a sort of an impression, hey, I'd like to know a little bit more, I am around to answer any questions that you may have on it. Okay? So you are unlikely to learn about 30 years of finance, I think you have the same experience, 
unlikely to learn this in the next 40 minutes or so. Okay, but what you will be uh, sort of given some information about is, wow, that's quite interesting. And for some of you, it will be thought-provoking, and that's my intention. That's the learning outcome from here, to get you to think seriously about decisions that you're about to make. If I leave you just with that, I think I've achieved my purpose. Okay? So, and along the way, hopefully, you will also learn about finance. Okay? So, when I am building a portfolio, so, I'm, so what sort of context am I going to be presenting to you in this example? I am essentially a fund manager. And typically, in the city of London, if I was working for one of the asset management firms, they would be giving some... So you may have to convert this into rupees. I'll, I'll have to talk about pounds. You know, apologies. But we are basically looking at assets under my management, which will be at least 30 million, more likely, more likely going into about 1 billion, if not 30 billion. I know fund managers who are as young as you are, who've got 30 billion under management, so it's got nothing to do with age. Okay? So, and it's not, wow, 30 billion, this person must be very rich. When you are in the world of finance, you don't worry about money because you're the custodian of the money. You are at the gates where money is flowing through. Okay? So my, if I can now start this talk off with a thought-provoking point, all of you, perhaps I'm, I'm wrong, I will stand corrected, all of you are thinking about, you know when I grow up, I want to be, here we go, we've got Mumbai here, fame, I want fame, I want success, I want wealth, I can see already people are nodding, yes? Or, all three, I want to be famous, I want to be in Bollywood or something, famous, I want to be successful, or I want to be incredibly wealthy, I want to be a billionaire. Absolutely amazing aspirations, nothing wrong with it. And there are lots and lots of corporates around the world which are managing funds, not in the billions, but in the trillions. They're managing companies of that size. They're there, they have faith, they have success, they have wealth, <coughs> but if they are polluting the whole environment, what is their use in life? What is the purpose? So if we're going to amass those hierarchy of needs, we are progressing. As you get more, as you get famous, you look for the next thing. As you get successful, you don't see that as success. You then go for the next thing. You go for wealth. So as you become more wealthy, you're looking for something else. So continually that desire to do something else, to achieve, increases. It's insatiable in that sort of fact. So where do you draw the line? That's the big question. Okay, so what I'm trying to say basically is when you get to a certain point, we're looking at large corporates. We're looking at corporates which are at least 300 billion in size. What are they thinking about? What's their purpose in life? Their purpose in life, as I hope you can take this away, as you get older, you probably will appreciate what I'm saying. Your objective in life is to make a difference. Your objective in life is to make a difference to societies and communities in which you live. That goes far beyond fame, success and wealth. It is far more enriching for you as an individual in your single limited life and to the others in this world because that is the prime purpose. Okay? So when you get there, you start seriously thinking about responsible investing. Okay? You become a responsible investor. And so this is why, as a wealth manager, 
what I am now doing is, so I'll give you the context, is that when you're a fund manager, you're usually given a mandate. Invest in US companies. Invest in European companies. Invest in Asian economies, whatever they are. Okay, and it could be Central Asia, it could be South Asia, whatever. We can subdivide this. But often, when you have a mandate as a fund manager, and you're growing up, given large amounts of money, you're usually given money to invest in areas regionally. That's how it begins. As you get more and more experience, your mandate then stretches across the whole world. And that's what very large fund managers are now doing. They can invest in companies anywhere in the world. And so essentially what they will start doing is, they will carry out an analysis and they will start stock picking. They will pick individual companies. Until they buy up those companies, until the 30 billion is invested. Okay? And then this now effectively becomes a portfolio. And that portfolio is the one that they will now run with minimum three months. So we will have an average value of this uh, stock portfolio. And then we will look at its value after three months. If you have done it right, you will see an increase in the value of that portfolio. Okay? So in other words, you have been successful. But in actual fact, if I just walk you back five minutes to where I started, it, it does not mean you are a responsible investor. It means you have picked stocks, and they could be the so-called sin stocks. I could invest in companies which are selling arms, selling alcohol, gambling, stocks which are so-called the sin stocks. But if you are in this world, which is the sale of investing, those are usually excluded from your list. Okay? So, sustainable investing is to invest now. My list of companies that I can now invest in, if I'm going globally, is narrowed down considerably, and I will just cross-hatch it for you. Meaning, this might be the world in which I can actually invest because the rest of them are non-investable, not ESG compliant funds or stocks or companies. Okay? So now you have to make a decision when you are building a portfolio. Am I going to go in the whole world and invest anywhere? Because I'm really hungry for success and hungry for pay. I want to be the best uh, fund manager in the city of London. You know, I want to have my name in all of the mutual funds that are called magazines are be famous. But does that mean you're responsible? What is your purpose in life? Make large amounts of money. This time, at this time of the year now, all fund managers are going in, they're having conversations, very serious conversations with management about what the bonuses are. Right? So just give you a rough idea, looking at your age group. If you come into finance straight away into the city of London, am I sort of and encourage them, encouraging them in the wrong direction. I just said I hesitate a little bit. Okay, so if, if uh, you are getting your bachelor's or your master's and you come out into the city of London, how much is my starting salary going to be like? Roughly about 40k, 40,000 pounds, right? After one year, it's going to double, 80. After five years, it'll be about 120. That's nothing. That is just your base salary. Now when I go and have a conversation and I am, let's say, 25 year old, I had a lot of success, I'm now famous. Yeah, I'm wealthy. What does it mean, 25? I'm still hungry. I think tomorrow I could be the world's best. Can you imagine where you are now, actually? No Absolutely no line anywhere about what you, where you could end up. It's dangerous. Always dangerous. Money is, is a is a heady uh, concoction really to have, and it does. It's happening all the time. So they they're going and they're going, right. I'm going to do it now. I'm meeting to, to strike up what my bonus is. I'm the best 
uh, trade in the city of London in the war. I think you need to now increase give me a bonus of minimum five million pounds. That's how it works. Okay. And if you go into the interview and say, how much money do you want? It's suddenly you sort of ship and want it. Boy, you name your price. If you say, oh, I want 120,000 pounds, they will say, okay, you earn 10 times that amount for us. If you don't, we give you what's called a P45 or, or a sacking ticket, basically. Walk out of the door. That's the life. And so you want to be famous, you want to be successful, and you want wealth, it's there. But then you ask yourself, why am I doing this? What is the purpose? I am giving money to companies, corporates, corporate boards. That's what I'm doing. I'm giving them, them this money to do what? Kill off the world? What am I investing in? Am I investing in on the right-hand side? Am I investing in companies which are going to give us a, a world and a, and a future life which is going to be looking like that? Or am I going to be a responsible investor and, and create companies, bigger companies, by investing in them who actually have the ability to give this not only to you, but the whole world, all of the different people who are living in the world. You're giving them a, a brighter future, not only for yourself, me, 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 it's not me, it's about, you know, everybody else who exists on the planet, yeah? And that's what we have, we have one planet. It's, this is serious, this is what now the focus is for this year. Everyone will be talking about responsible investing, sustainability, so this is brand new off the shelf, if you like, as an idea, if you haven't captured it already. This 2020 and the next 10 years is going to be about sustainable investing. Okay? And you are the persons who are going to be responsible because you are the next generation. The millennials coming up, women investors, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this, exactly what the role of women investors are. Basically where I'm coming from, uh, London, there is no difference. We have women on boards with about 50%. If, if they ask for 60%, 70%, they want to be on the board, yes, but you have to be talented. Okay? It's about talent. That's what really counts. It's not about your gender. It's not where you come from. It's not who you are. Or any one of those other little ways that you want to classify individuals. It's got nothing to do with that. Yes, it goes beyond that. It's, it's actually about the individual who has the, the talent is going to make a difference to our world. Okay, and, and when you have that and you recognize it, you have, we give people opportunities. We have a really diverse uh, community in London, New York, anywhere, being around the place as well. It's incredibly diverse and it's about talent. That's, that's, keep that in mind. So, if I may now uh, very quickly go to ESG investing, its importance is even greater in Asian economies. You know why? Because Asian economies have got populations which are 25 around that, so that's, the, that's an advantage. Yes, it is a, a distinct advantage. So we've got China, India making up a large proportion of the whole world, growing at a fast pace now. When you grow, what, what happens? Your demand for energy is going to go up. It's, it's, it's exponential and increase. So, so, so we may say, oh, you know what? It's all the fault of these, these people in the Western world. I mean, they're the ones who are pointing the finger at us. We're just growing. And so they're blaming us for climatic change. It's not that. It's larger population which is growing at, at, at a certain rate. But the responsibility is just as great in the sense that if you're going to be used consuming electricity and all that, consume it efficiently. If you're consuming water, consume it efficiently. The responsibility still rests wherever you are. Okay, it's not a regional sort of uh, dependence as it were. Yes, uh, uh, people in the West are more profitable with water and all the rest of it, but that doesn't mean that they, they can be irresponsible with it. So this is the message throughout the whole world. You have to be responsible because it is only one planet, right? And so, as Asian economies are expanding rapidly, if there's a good sense about using using all the resources we've got economically, I think then 
everybody is making a difference, and that's the main point. Yes. So, so it's it's incredibly ESG investing is it's important is even greater in Asian economies, and the value of using uh, products, really smart products, for managing this. And I'll show you a technique later on. Maybe it gets a little bit mathematical. I know we have quite a diverse uh, group. But I'll try to sort of explain it in, in a way that is more interesting, shall we say. So if you're mathematical in your background and it's not coming through, it's not fascinating, please forgive me, but we can have that treatment if you want. I can run a class on fixed income analysis or uh, modern portfolio management and also derivatives where you can start to see the big maths actually kicking in. But I'm only trying to give you a flavor at the moment about how we use these very clever techniques to actually dig out, eke out the pure ESG factor. That's what I'm trying to do. So if, if I want to find out, let's say you're all stocks, which one of you is the most efficient in terms of ESG? And that's the, you are the ones I want to invest in, right? I've got to know a lot more about you, yes? So that's, our, that's what we want to do with companies. And companies are not very good at disclosing these things very well, you see. They want to disclose to you that I am ESG compliant or I am not ESG compliant. I will give you a disclosure policy. I will disclose after the chairman's statement, the CEO, I will disclose to you that, oh, we are really good. We, we um, uh, conserve energy and all of those wonderful things. Just what you want to hear. I'll give you those, but that doesn't mean that because I have a disclosure policy, I am ESG compliant. And so what techniques have we got to identify that you are indeed ESG compliant, and then we need to invest in you more. Is that giving a feeling of it? So this is now the corporate level. So yesterday's talk was to the Institute of Directors in India. Same lecture, basically. A lighter version, if you like, but the message is the same. I'm a fund manager, and I'm working with fund managers. And we will find out exactly how ESG compliant you are. If you're not, forget it, because you're not going to get my money or, or, or my investors' money that I'm a custodian for. Yes? So that's basically the message. And I think uh, when I spoke to the chairman uh, uh, of the IOT, and he's saying, we have this, we're doing this, and this. there's no reason for me not to doubt him, but what he needs to know is we have really good ways of picking up if he is right, companies are right, or not. Okay, that's, that's what I'm going to show you very quickly. So, so I'm going to be using a technique which is uh, for risk management, financial risk management, they're powerful uh, products for financial derivatives. And they have an amazing way of delineating, extracting the sort of information you want. So, for example, I'm sorry, I have to scribble a bit here. For example, if I look at uh, S&P 500, which is 500 of the biggest companies in the U.S., if I look at the S&P 500, it's a whole composite of massive companies basically ruling the whole world, with are trillions. So you've got 500 of the biggest companies, they own parts of the world as well. So some of them have got ESG compliant companies, stocks in them, others haven't. So how am I now going to extract what the value is of that? Somebody goes and does all the hard work for us and digs out, if you like, those companies which are meeting specific criteria, and you will probably ask me where are these criteria, there are uh, two main agencies, rating agencies, who are uh, scrutinizing the annual reports of every company which is coming up, uh, and in the ESG field, the two that we have got, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm actually hitting the wrong buttons, please forgive me. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to way back, sorry. I'm getting a bit excited with this, this uh, clicker at the moment. Uh, so we are selecting individual companies, which are ESG, S, G, ESG compliant, whatever they are. So we are identifying those stocks, and then we are saying, right, the 500 are only interested in 100, and then we're investing in any of the others, until it become clean, basically. 
So when I'm convinced you're clean, you'll be part of my list, and then I'll be routinely investing in you and making you grow at a faster rate. Big question that came up when we first started talking about ESG five years ago. Why? Because in actual fact, if you look at SIN stocks, if you call us SIN stocks, we're non-ESG compliant, uh, we grow faster than you do. As a matter of fact, if you want me to be ESG compliant, you don't want me to actually have water in that bottle, because that's not ESG compliant. That's polluting our rivers and our, all of our oceans. Yeah? That's not ESG compliant. So why should I invest in you as a water company? Yeah? The same way we'll have a little of the water. If, you go, if I go into another way of storing water for you to consume, it's going to be more expensive. So since it's expensive, it's going to hit my return on investment, and so I'm not interested. So that's how it all began. Okay? So it all began. So there was a reason I said, well, this is the myth that if you invest in something which is ESG compliant, it's going to be more costly. I'm not interested in that, basically. So, so that's where we came from. So when I'm now just selecting stocks out of the SMB and putting them into a list, I'm using a technique which is called smart beta. It's got a word, a big word. It means selectively looking at certain features or themes that I, I'm, I'm going to be uh, more interested in. Uh, in terms of investment. So that's what we're going to look at. Smart. Have I got a way of delineating here? How much is its value? That's what we're trying to do at the moment. So I think the message hopefully is there now about from now onwards, if you've got any cash, extra cash, and you're seriously interested in buying stocks, please go into ESG compliant stocks. Where am I going to find out who they are? Look at Morningstar. Morningstar is a very uh, big company investing large sums. This 30 billion is nothing compared to what Morningstar, a machine that go about 300 years and tell you exactly where the stock price level was in any country. That's the power of the robot. That's the power of artificial intelligence. So it, it, it does the hard work for me. It does the quick calculations. I want to use artificial intelligence, the machine, as a friend, as a tool to assist me to make the decisions that I need to do, and that is for our survival, isn't it? Okay? So that's basically what, what the use is. There's lots and lots of people talking about artificial intelligence and why it's not good and all the rest of it. But use it effectively and you're going to make intelligent decisions. That's we have an MSC in FinTech coming up in September 2020. It's going to be basically looking at building uh, funds that we are about to look at in terms of using FinTech, using artificial intelligence, machine learning, and, and part of it involves predictive analytics as well. Okay, so that's coming up. And the reason why we brought this program on is because of massive need. Because now, I think, uh, getting too old now, Need all of these reports of 500 stocks identifying which ones ESG compliant. I'm going to be there for a couple of weeks for sure. I'm an analyst. Boy, you don't need to be an analyst anymore of that type. It's gone. The analyst needs to be put a machine to work. It'll read the narrative. And so long as you give it the right code, it's about linguistics. Those of you who are not interested in what I'm talking about, Get into linguistics is a very powerful skill that will be useful now. So that's the job basically. So we're going to be looking at financial derivatives to uh, bring out uh, some of the smart beta aspects. I will be using examples of small caps, small companies. I'll be using an example of big companies as well. We'll have a look at the results. There's lots and lots of data, um, and we'll work through it. I'm sure we'll get there. Can I? I'll leave this slide with you and I'll ask for your, your lecturers to basically uh, uh, let you have the copies and, and by all means uh, scrutinize it, read it, see exactly what the content is. It's all there, it's good stuff. But if I may just at this point, time's always running short. Three hours is never enough. I only have 40 minutes with you. Okay, so investment is an investment process. Sustainable finance and ESG investing. So it's, it's a process that we all have to go through when we're doing this job. 
uh, that basically uses these really important thematics, environment, social, governance, what the board does, what the board make up, is it diverse, and so on. All of those, those criteria that we've got there are going to be combined to make an assessment about individual <coughs> stocks, actually beneath the companies, beneath the people who sit on boards. Okay? It's about people who are making those decisions. We make an assessment. Why? We will see whether we want to invest in them. We're going to make an, uh, an assessment of them to see whether the products and services they're providing the whole world, whether they're actually genuinely beneficial. <coughs> Not the primary benefit, but also the secondary and tertiary ones. Is it good for the environment? What are the, 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 the risks? Have they looked at those carefully? Is there an option? If there's a better option, why aren't they using it? And so on. So, is it going to be having an impact on societies and communities? That's the main message. I think the rest of it is just a bit of a trawl telling you about what the SG is, who's doing it, and so on and why it's so important that the different types of organisations around the world are taking this, this very difficult challenge, really grasping, grasping the nettle, as you were, really grasping the thorny issues and, and, and taking it to the next step. So I am, if you like, just uh, as fund manager, as an epidemic, I am just a messenger. It is a serious matter that we all need to Aware of, if you don't really want to go into it's fine. Aware of. This, this simple slide here shows you Morningstar. Remember I mentioned the company Morningstar? It's investing, it's investing, picking stocks as I was doing, and they do it in different categories, and they've done exactly this. Within those stocks, they have picked those stocks which are ESG compliant, the green blocks, and then they've invested in another batch, which is a comparator, and they've, they've got the yellow ones, you can clearly see across there, the majority of them, 80% of the green lines, are bigger than the yellow lines. Higher returns, higher shareholder returns on ESG compliant funds. So it's a myth to say that if you go into uh, ESG investing, it's going to be very expensive and you're not going to deliver the returns the shareholder wants. The actual evidence is anything but, actually, they are benefiting the, the, the societies and communities, but they're also getting a pick-up. So, uh, this is just uh, about uh, renewable energy. Yeah, we, we carbon is, is polluting, we need it. I think China is probably digging out vast amounts of coal from the ground. In the UK alone, this might come as a surprise, we've got about 500 years of coal underneath the ground and continue to burn it for the next 500 years until the whole uh, earth has gone to smithereens, basically. Polar ice caps have all melted, areas have flooded out, we're going to have the sort of disasters you have seen in Australia, recently. All, all the rest of it is definitely climate change. We are not having an impact. It's just new millennials coming up to us. This our generation, it's your fault actually. You're the ones who have been polluting it. Why are you asking us to take care of it? Yes, that's a survival argument. Yes, it's definitely that. So, uh, it, it pays. It definitely pays. So I've got another, another slide on it. This one is probably now going to convert all of that information into numbers. For those of you who love numbers, so this is a chart that you can see the blue line. The blue line are ESG compliant. It's a large fund which has been created uh, by the uh, MSC, yeah, this MSCI index. It's called MSCI KLD, KLD, 400 stocks. They're all ESG stocks. So they've built up a portfolio of 400, 400 companies. And they are now looking at how their share prices have moved from one time point to another time point. Convert this into returns. It's very simply divide one price by the other and take away by one. You convert it into a return and compare it to another MSC fund, MSCI fund, the compliant S&P 500, US, 500 companies. 
you can see clearly the difference between the two, the blue lines higher than the, than, than, the, uh, um, than the brown or orange line numbers. What does that mean? I can see that. MSC KLD 400, 9.67% return per annum over this time, 1990 to 2016. Continuous, 9.67% per annum return. Yeah, push one million through that and make that grow on compounding, you will see what your terminal wealth will be. Put the same thing, one million, in an S&P 500, which we blindly we've been doing for years and years and years, if you want to have a stock which is, which is going to be passive investment, as we call it, right? It is investing in the seed. S&P 500 is as good as any. You, you got a return of 8.76. Yeah, so that is that's that's just under one percent, one hundred basis point pick up. It's a one percent increase in the return to an investor. Shareholder wealth has been increased in ESG companies. Isn't that amazing? Right. So the, I'm just looking at stocks. We in finance, we've got other products that we can also invest in. We can lend money to governments and companies. Well, and without they pay us interest, right? Coupon interest, if you like. So we invest in those. As a matter of fact, look at the other uh, diagram on that bottom, the left hand side, the green bond market from 2012 to 2016. It's a very quickly run an eye across there. It's like uh, uh, an exponential growth, isn't it? So there's an exponential growth that's actually taking place. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's taking place at the moment in, in, in investing in climate climate funds. So I think uh, very quickly I'm, I'm getting the nod there. Uh, that I think it's time's up. Can you five, ten minutes, ten yes. minutes, very quickly. So this is for those of you who are really interested in now uh, moving forward, moving deciding forward, and want to seriously um, a draw the list of how am I going to select the stock. The um, Sustainability and Accounting Standards Board in the US has taken this major step of identifying, and it's on the left hand side that you see all of those bits you can't kind of hardly read, but you will be able to read it when you look at my slides. Okay, it's not because it's a very poor uh, sort of uh, reproduction that you see up here. These are all of the factors that they've got in those different categories. So I've got environment. I've got uh, environment on one side, so the whole set of categories, social capital, human capital, business, modern and innovation, leadership and governance. How diverse is your board? Have you got women, women managers on your, on your board? It's, we know from, from our investment uh, uh, experience, if you bring women um, as, as investment managers, as fund managers, they tend to be safer. Yeah, that doesn't mean that they're... They give low returns. They just are more risk of that. But they're, they're sometimes very better and better at selecting those rather than actually having uh, the men who are, you know, just um, fueling through and uh, getting a bit too irate about different things. So, so I think they make mistakes. I think huge mistakes. Here's another one. Did you know this part of the brain is the slow thinking brain? That's the brain when I asked you was 20 multiplied by 2, I can't remember now. That bit here, that's a slow thinking brain. I kicked that one off when I asked you that question. Slow thinking brain is required when you need to be thinking about a decision which is really important. Okay? So when I kicked that off, the slow thinking brain hasn't, your prefrontal cortex hasn't even developed by the time you are about 28. Did you know that? So some of the decisions you are making at the moment I mean, are rash decisions because that brain, part of the brain, is getting wired up. It doesn't finish wiring up until you're in your 30s. Here's a, here's a revelation. So be careful. You're taking risks. Yeah? Because it's not... It only realize, oops, I've done something wrong. Experience. It's all wired up. Okay. So, what I've got is the whole sort of material risk factors against individual sectors. Healthcare has got lots of those brown bars on it. Each one of those says that 50% of the companies in that sector 
have to watch out for that particular risk factor. It's an ESG risk factor. This is what I was saying to the IOD yesterday. We are happy to give you consultancy. We can improve your your share of your your company's uh, credit risk rating. We can improve your performance. And so we can explain to you exactly what you want to do. And here's a piece of consultancy advice for you. You can all be consultants tomorrow with the same people. Have a look at the ones which are all in red and identify exactly where each one of those companies is, GlaxoSmithKline, Beecham, Novartis, whoever, where they are. Identify those and try to minimize those risk factors. If you minimize those risk factors, their performance will go up. Why? Because we're watching it. And we're more happy in investing in companies which have got low, those risk factors are being minimized. You won't be able to eliminate it, but if you're making an effort, disclose the documents, say more about those things, I think you get the message. That's where the secret is. So please, if you get a chance and you are a student of finance and student of investing, please have a look at this slide, forget everything else. That was all interesting, I hope. Okay, so so that's that's going to be very very useful for you. If I may now go quickly into it, what we do is I built up a company of small stocks. I went up there and, uh, and uh, on Google ESG stocks. Give me the the, the next uh, best 50 stocks for this year. They gave me a list. I grabbed it. So I've got these are US uh, Hans Brands, Gap, uh, Perigo, blah blah blah. All of those. It just took them. Blindly, no, no analysis, and just took their share prices. And I said, I'm going to invest a certain number of, of my money, which I've got. I had 110 million dollars, uh, so I invested 110 million dollars across all of those stocks. Okay, on a market cap basis. So there was a little bit of science going into it, and then I looked at what the market value of my portfolio was at the start last year. So uh, last year I invested 110.8 million dollars. I quickly worked out the risk of each one of those companies. If the, if the risk is measured by something called beta of stock. So I, I actually calculated what the beta of the, the, the portfolio, sub small portfolio was. It's coming up at 1.15. I won't go into the details of it. And then I looked at what my portfolio was valued at at the end of one year. Okay, so at the end of one year, it started at 120, ended up at 129. So, wow, this is amazing. Have I really selected ESG stocks? So, I wasn't sure. So, I went into the futures market, and I got the nearest futures index that I thought would be mirroring my composition, my portfolio, and I sold the futures against my cash. Okay? So if I sell the futures, I am selling a certain component, if you like, quality in my portfolio and extracting it, which is the market risk. And then I'm looking at exactly what the value is. Here's the answer. So when I did this, uh, and all of this is, is, is uh, buying stocks, selling futures against it, and my net position was $195,953 loss. Okay, not very good for an ESG class, is it? You're wasting your time. What's the point of talking about ESG when you're taking losses? That's when I start thinking, ah, okay, small companies. Are they genuinely ESG compliant? They say they are. Are small companies genuinely compliant? So I said, okay, let's go, let's have a look at the next batch, the big ones. So, so the same experiment, if you like, is now re repeated with the same small stocks, but I put in the big ones in there as well. These are the billions, 500 billion size companies. You know Microsoft, yes? Microsoft stocks, in now in my portfolio, I'm investing in it. Procter & Gamble, Visa, Verizon, AT&T, Intel, Mastercard, Disney. Big companies. I put them into the stock. Why? Because they are ESG compliant. Okay, Tata is ESG compliant. By the way, going to invest in it. it on, a, on an ESG ranking, is 87 out of 100. 
your nifty 100 years gene, if you have a look at it roughly, is coming at 70 on that scale. The poorest is at 25. Okay, to so give you a rough idea. So I've invested in them, so this is my starting position on my portfolio, I've got 100 million now invested. And then after one year, this is, this is ended this year, my portfolio has gone to 157 million. That's where it is. But against this portfolio, I sold. I sold against it a futures contract because I wanted to hedge out, eliminate the risk which is which is uh, the beta risk. Okay. So as I eliminated it, this is the combined profit I get at the end of it: 22 million profit. That's, that looks like an ESG profit. Big companies are more ESG compliant than small companies are because they know what their purpose is in life. Okay. So there's the message there. So, so there's a lot I have covered, short of time. We have a fantastic MSC <coughs> FinTech with business analytics. It's, it's designed specifically to educate you with the analytical skills you need in finance to meet the needs of the future generation in the city of London, in New York, and, and our, our students come from all over the world. So they go all over the world and they'll be investing for Morgan Stanley, you name it. Okay, so this particular degree now is slowly becoming in high demand as we are transforming out of traditional courses. We're moving out of finance traditional. I think the current finance programs that we've got will probably be out of date in five years' time. Okay, so these are the new degrees. That's the next generation. So we've only, I've only got five years' shelf life on MSC investment, risk finance, MSC finance, and so on. They're good to give us the cash that we want, but there's no way that they're going to be uh, the next generation of products in terms of educational products. So we're developing them. This is our next. And, and there's another one that's coming up that's Reg Tech for the slightly lawyers among, among you who've got that type of mind. Compliance, uh, financial crime, cyber crime, all of those sort of things. There's a, there's a new degree we're planning. It's MSC regulation technology is massive. So I've got a financial lawyer on board or we've hired, and we're working on projects like this with the um, Financial uh, Conduct Authority, which is the main regulator in the UK, and also we're visiting the Bank of England on uh, Prudential Regulation Authority, and these are the things that the central bankers actually need. So, whirlwind uh, intro to finance, what the themes are. But thank you very much for having me here, it's been a real pleasure. Okay, I, I did notice a lot of you nodding and eyes full open, and that's always a good sign for anybody who's next to you. So thank you very much, you did wonderful. <laughs> Uh, energy, or uh, you know, 
uh, improving or, or making energy management systems more effective. If we're starting to see that in the chips that they're buying in all the rest of it, they definitely get, if you like, a plus point or something. So on a life at scale from one to five, I will start to rank them higher than the others who are also doing the same thing but are using less efficient chips, shall we say. Okay, so, so that's what we will do. We'll look at each one of those boxes to see where they're most polluting, if you like, and see what efforts they're making to reduce those, uh, the, 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 you know, those risks. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so what will happen when you talk about fiduciary relationships between clients and investors along with ESG investors? Do you think it's a conflict of interest somewhere down the line? Uh, because their job would be to maximize profits, yeah. but when you Okay, this is, this is a brilliant question in the sense that we're all running for fame, success, wealth, right? So these companies which are hungry are only interested in those three qualities of credentials. Actually, shareholder wealth is what they're pursuing. Shareholder wealth models are no longer considered to be of, of paramount importance. Along with shareholder wealth, getting fame, success, wealth, you also want to make sure that when you are trying to achieve those ambitions, you are being good to everybody else, yeah? and you're also being very kind to the environment. So you have to show that human aspect to your, your investing as well, as a corporate board member. Yes, so there shouldn't really be any conflict, but I can see the challenges coming up, very difficult conversations that fund managers will have with companies and so on, but I think those will rest on, you know, what are their values? What are truly their values? If their values are not that, then perhaps you should be investing in it because your values are about making your environment a much better place, sustainable. Any other questions?